Breakfast today is Mr. Thompson. Can you see that? Can you see that? Go on, right. go on, go on, get up there. Hello, -ho. look at that. You know what that is? Yeah, I know that's the red ensign, but that's wind. It's wind in my sails. Wind. <laughs> it's eight o'clock Zulu on Friday the 12th of July and I managed to drift for about uh, 14 hours and <laughs> travelled about six nautical miles just on the tide on the current in 14 hours just waiting for the wind and this is I mean that's substantial that's nine knots so that's not um, it's not just here today gone tomorrow I was expecting it to be from the west and this is from the north so maybe it's gonna swing round or or maybe I'm deluded <laughs> look Dave you're going sailing hooray finally no you're fucking not oh maybe you're no you're fucking not yeah there you go off we go sailing oh, fuck off 11 12th of July 11.30 lunchtime 12th Zulu Zulu lunch. I wonder what Zulus have for lunch. Elephants, probably. How do you eat them, though? Oh, one mouthful at a time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm slowly losing my mind. Still becalmed, still waiting for the wind to, to uh, push in. And things have got so bad that, based on a whim and a suggestion from a friend over the internet, I've shaved my bloody beard off. The wind is testing my patience today. I am, I'm, I'm not kidding you, I'm howling, I'm howling at the moon here, this is driving me crazy. It's now 20 past 3, and we're still waiting for the wind to kick in. I'm going to assume that's the front I've been waiting for for two days, and behind it is the westerly wind it's going to take me through the Straits of Gibraltar. Of course, I've made assumptions before. And they made an ass out of me and out of me. Yeah, let's see. Two days now wasted, not wasted, but two days drifting in the Bay of Cadiz. Yeah, still. The music's good. Charlie Parker and Miles Davis. It's, uh, Lobster pots. A lot of them. If I was cheeky, I'd whip over and have one up, but I'm not cheeky. That's someone's uh, living there, rather than my supper. As you can see, we're making great progress. That's what two knots looks like. Welcome yeah, to the to chart station the hub of our operation here. Uh, here we can see we have a radio and over here we have some switches. I will eventually get round to fitting the last one but you know I'm kind of getting used to it like that now. Here's our electrical monitoring system. We have 95% will to live remaining which is good. It's very high. It's been much lower over the last few days. And down here we can see the chart for the next part of our journey. We're currently over here. Can you see that? I don't know. You're tucked between my bosoms. Did I tell you that? Uh, yeah, I guess you can see that. We're currently over here. And we are heading for here, Tarifa. And we're going to go over here, which is Trafalgar, good place for battle. After Tarifa, we shall be coming up along, no, not too close, up along here to here, Cabo de Gata, Cape of the Cat, I don't know, it's all Spanish to me. Um, so that will be our next leg in the journey. Uh, assuming that we <laughs> that the will to live meter doesn't get too low there are many uh, places along the way which we could stop in for a shag and a beer 
Marbella, Malaga. Uh, where was that other nice place? Uh, Alamera yeah, up here. And there's a, the other smaller marinas as well. So, and we're never very far off the coast. Now look, here's a little trick. Get some of these, put them on a main jobber, stretch them out to something comfortable. I'm going to go there. That's 30. That's 30 minutes or 30 miles in this area of the world. So if I stick that on Tarifa there, I can go... And, and you know, it's not going to be straight because my boat doesn't go straight. So that's 30, 60, oh, sliding all over the place, 90, 120, there's a mountain there, flatten it out, 150, eh, just short of 180, so about 170, I guess that's about 170, 170 nautical miles from here to here, and at no point am I more than 30 miles offshore and it's, it's like coastal passage 30 miles is <laughs> it's small fry so yeah there's going to be lots of uh <laughs> temptation to uh whip into somewhere and have a cold beer and a, and a proper shower but i'm going to press along the coast as long as my milk and cigarettes hold out uh yeah it's um zero seven two is the is the course now if you were being all fancy pants you might try and find some tidal atlases and calculate how many hours it's going to take you to do 178 doofers and uh, it's about two days for me the way things are going easily two days well let's we'll say two days uh, so 48 hours and then you look at the tide here 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 and uh, the, the tidal flow and you'd, you'd you'd note them all down and then you start there and then you do the tide one hour here one hour there one hour one hour, and you go like in a random <laughs> until you ended up with a point and then you know your speed of your boat and then you know how many um how many hours you're going to go at that speed so you need a line that long and you draw that line that long until it crosses the original course line you draw a line on course from here to here so from uh, from all of the blah, tidal correction you'll end up somewhere you I mean you could end up up here you could end up down there uh, it's, it's two days the tides are going to basically cancel themselves out anyway so you'll probably end up right there but then you draw your line of how far you can go and wherever that mm, intercepts the original course line the end of that line intercepts it could be before could be after doesn't matter then this would be the course to steer in order to achieve this course along the along the the water and so of course you have to be a little bit aware because if you start off steering this course that you've calculated from here you run aground so it's not always appropriate to do that <laughs> uh, but yeah that's how you would do like a course to steer and then there's lights all the way along here and what I like about these charts is when they when they show you the lights, they, they give you the details of the lights. You know, how many flashes, how many seconds, how many miles away you should be able to see it. And, and so you could basically just navigate via these lights. Many of these I'll be too far off to see. But if I was closer, I'd be able to see the lights. And I keep a track on roughly where I am. And then I can take bearings, time, bearing, and work out where I am the whole time. Or... I can look on there because that's connected to a GPS receiver, which is WAS enabled, wide area augmentation system. Well, SBAS to give it its proper name. So a space-based augmentation system, which means that this position here is accurate to about five meters. Up here, uh, here is my tracking device. This is very good, by the way. Oh, it's flashing, I've got a message. Um, oh, no, you're not looking at it. You're looking at it now. So this is my tracker, my Garmin tracker. Again, this is SBAS enabled, accurate to about three meters. Even tells you on here how accurate it is. If I can, the only problem is I, it's very dark. So somewhere on here, there's a, a location, 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 location. There you go. Look, uh, accuracy two plus or minus two meters. Elevation minus ten meters. I'm, I'm, I'm a submarine. N no, I'm not a submarine. That's based on uh, a sphere, 
which is a theoretical sphere, so you can be above and below that all the time. And that's my Latin long. So I can do it this way and know exactly where I am, or I can use the lights and I can take that position from up there, that, that position from up there, framing, and, and I could draw a little cross on the chart down there and keep doing that. It's rather tedious, makes a mess of your chart. Or just get exactly the same chart on your iPad. This is exactly the same chart, you see? It's me, mini me. <laughs> it's the same chart. And uh, link that to your very accurate I don't know if you can see this. So you link this to your very accurate Garmin and then you've got you on there all the time, where you are, where you're going, doof for doof So it's super easy to, to use this equipment. Now what I've got effectively is with the Garmin and the iPad, I have a completely independent navigation system compared to the boat, which has its own GPS receiver and instrumentation. On top of that, I've got the paper charts and a bit of old fashioned adding and subtracting to do that and for my um, Garmin and, uh, and iPad solution to make it really truly independent because of course it needs the electricity electricity is coming from the boat battery ah <laughs> not necessarily you see here we have Voltaic something or other, I can't remember which one it is called. That's a 10 watt solar panel with a big battery in there with a USB connector. So I can charge the iPad and the Garmin from their own independent solar power source. So if I did end up in the dinghy, by the way, uh, yeah, I'll show, might as well show you everything now. Oh no, I'm revealing all the secrets. So there's my EPIRB. Here is my, um, it's not, what do you call that, life, uh, life raft. Um, there's some, uh, some flares in there. So EPIRB, life raft and flares. Handheld radio to go with it. And here, this would be my emergency water supply if I did have to abandon. So I started off with 25 liters in there, but now that I'm so close to land, I'm 30 miles from land. Basically, I don't need to have any emergency water anymore. And this is a lot sweeter to drink than the water that's in the main tank on the boat. So this is my drinking water for just drinking water now. Um, yeah, there's the uh, stuff in there. There's stuff in there. This is where I keep like the ropes and, and stuff. Uh, over here is uh, Mr. Wu's Chinese laundry. Everything on a boat gets, um, gets wet because of the dew. The morning and the evening dew. Um, and, and it's soaking inside and out because it's not sealed and it's not um, insulated very well. So just everything gets wet uh, and it's inevitable unless you keep it in sealed bags, uh, which I should have done, but you know, I, I, knew, I was expecting this. And this is my current bunk with the blackout shades, poured out starboard home and all that. Um, this is to keep the sun from blaring in here. I would put one over this window as well, but there is a slight fire hazard of putting a plastic bag over this particular window. So that one has to leave a stay open. There's other things like I could cut something that's not gonna set catch fire and stick it on there as well. But you know, it's nice to have a look out while you're waiting for the kettle to boil. That's another thing. It's another thing the, when the kettle boils, fills the whole boat full of steam. Steam then cools the condensers, more wetness, water everywhere. So all these kind of considerations. What else? I'm giving you the full tour of my boat now. I wish I knew the music from Steve Zizou when he does like the tour of the boat. Um, storage for rubbish. <laughs> You're gonna love this. This is the, uh, the fore cabin. Now normally on like modern boats, this is like a posh little double bunk blah 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 well I could have a double bunk in here I got mattress blah blah but as you can see this is the ocean voyaging so this is storage storage behind there this is up because behind there I've put my my dinghy that's the dinghy 
um, which is massive. Well, it's not it's not a big dinghy, but it doesn't fold down very small. It weighs 30 kilos. It's a pain in the ass. I'm thinking of just getting a little inflatable kayak instead. And over here we got rubbish. This is all rubbish in here that I, you know I haven't been throwing it overboard. I've been collecting my rubbish in here. This is the laundry. So these are clothes that aren't really viable anymore because <laughs> they don't have to be clean to be viable. I can tell you. And then sails. That's the symmetrical spinnaker. This is the storm jib. There's another full uh, Genoa up there, which I'm never going to use, but I got it in case I need it. And of course, right now the asymmetric is flying. The normal Genoa is rolled. It's not flying very well, but that's because there's about three knots of wind. Not even enough to inflate that super lightweight material. Um, yeah. Oh, and now the uh, the business end, the heads. So yeah, completely, you know, not glamorous, but fully functional. But I don't want to lift up the lid just in case. Hang on, look away. Ah, there we go. Well, it's actually it's fine. <laughs> Sometimes um, this this is the drainage outlet pipe goes up here, over there down there and through that sea cock there which is closed at the moment sometimes i like to have it closed when i'm at sea except when i'm flushing and when you close it sometimes whatever's in this pipe if the sea's rough feeds back into the toilet so you sometimes get some you sh i flush enough that there shouldn't be any crud in there but inevitably there is a bit of this and that um yeah so this is like a 1920s design sea toilet they cost about five grand to buy new. You can still buy them new. Frankly, I'm seriously thinking of uh, replacing it with something more modern. Um, but it looks, you know, it's in keeping with the boat, so. And I've got a water, this is from the fresh water tank here for washing your hands in this crappy sink. Like I'm ever, ever going to use that. And you see it drains drains down that pipe overboard so it's all good but I mean really I'm never going to use it I'm going to take it off but I was going to take it off during this journey but then I realized if I take it off I've just got to put it somewhere till I get somewhere and, and so I might as well just leave it here because that's a convenient place for it to be until I want to throw it in the bin but yeah so that, uh, probably do some work on this area eh, probably up here we've got a unique wiring scheme whereby I have disconnected the um, spreader running light, steaming light, because it normally is connected here and is powered by the same power supply that powers the port, starboard and rear um, nav lights, deck light, deck level nav lights. And that's fine because they're the ones I use when I am steaming under power and when you're doing that you need to have a white light as well. However, comma, my aft navigation light has failed. It's the white light at the back. So, and it's the cabling that's failed. I, I, I checked the bulb, checked everything. I know, I know specifically which bit of the cabling has failed, but I can't get to it. I tried. So, improvise, overcome. What I've got is I've got an anchor light at the top of my mast. The anchor light shines in all directions including the aft po portion that that guy would normally do if I was steaming and the forward portion that the steaming light would do so by using the anchor light and just the port and starboard nav lights I meet the requirements for navigation lights but I wouldn't do if the spreader was coming on as well because then I'd have two white lights and that would confuse the hell out of everyone including myself so I had to disconnect the spreader light in order to use the anchor light for steaming when required. <sighs> that was boring, Dave. No one's going to get to the end of that one. <laughs>